everybody for coming and being here virtually. It's the new world we're in. Um, I am going to be talking about feline respiratory emergencies, which are always tricky, even in big fancy facilities like here. And so I want to try and give us some tips to help us take care of them and help sort of guide your therapy and make sure that our stress levels are as low as possible for both our patients and ourselves. And I will have plenty of time at the end for questions. So first things first. So these are a few different things that I'm gonna be talking about. So we're gonna first off start with the respiratory anatomy. A couple different definitions and some presentations that you're gonna be noticing. A very important piece of your physical exam is gonna be really to sit back and look at the way the patient is breathing. We'll talk about some diagnostics and therapy as well. So as far as the anatomy, a lot of the times when we're talking about respiratory emergencies in cats, we're usually more focused on what's going on in the chest or around the chest. But we need to remember that your respiratory tract starts from your nose and your mouth all the way down to your trachea, into your main stem bronchi, into the little bronchioles and alveoli. And it can also be affected by those things surrounding it. So your neck, your oropharynx, and that pleural space as well. So just don't forget that part and just keep in mind that we have to sort of focus on all those same things at once. And so as far as the upper airway, we talk about the oral cavity, the oropharynx, the pharynx and trachea. And what I wanna point out is sometimes you can have oral disease or even nasal disease present as your open mouth breathing cat. Partially, sometimes they just can't breathe through their nose and they usually are obligate nasal breathers, which is why seeing a cat with their mouth open when they're breathing is very abnormal. But there are definitely some things that can cause a cat to breathe with their mouth open that are not necessarily respiratory emergencies. So if you look at these pictures that I stole from Dr. Jan Bellows, you'll see this set of cats, they have severe oropharyngeal disease. They have disease in the back of their throat. These are the kind of cats that you're gonna see coming in with their mouth open, maybe with their tongue out. Here is two cases of mine. If you look at the cat that's on your far left, it is zoomed in in the middle there. This cat had an incomplete soft palate and hard palate. And if you look really closely at where the tonsils are, that is so incredibly inflamed. This cat had a hard time breathing, but also swallowing. And he came in open mouth breathing. However, his respiratory tract was totally fine. And so don't forget about that. And if you look at that cat on the right side there, he actually has nothing going on with his respiratory tract. He has bilateral trigeminal neuropathy, so he's not able to close his mouth. But if you were to look at him from afar, you have a cat who's panting with their tongue out. So sometimes we do need to back up and remember that not every cat with their mouth open is in overt respiratory distress. We don't often talk about feline tracheal disease. It's more of a dog thing. But if you look at this patient here, do you notice how poofy his face is? So it looks really cute, but he's got a very globoid type head. And if you were to touch it, it is a lot of sub-Q emphysema. This is not that cat, but what you'll notice here, this cat has a ton of sub-Q emphysema. He's got a pneumomediastinum. He's a little bit of a pneumothorax. And you could see that sub-Q emphysema tracking all the way down to this cat's tail. So what happened? Well, tracheal tear. This is something that you rarely will have to address surgically. But if you see this picture here, we actually did end up having to surgically fix that cat. What you're looking at there, if you look closely, just between the suture and the hemostat, you can actually see our endotracheal tube there. So usually you have a tiny little tear that's self-limiting and you just need to let these cats relax, keep them calm, keep them comfortable, and that tracheal tear will heal on its own. This is actually the only time I've ever had to force my surgeon to do it. Um, they were very reluctant because you never have to, but I'm super glad we did. It was not responding to traditional care for two days. And the cat ended up going home, I think a day and a half after this picture. You'll notice I have dentals here. So there's a couple different articles that cite dentals are one of the most common causes of tracheal tears in cats. 
We're not 100% sure why, but what we think is happening is we're automatically inflating those endotracheal tubes a little more than we normally would because we have liquids shooting down into the airways and we want to make sure it doesn't go down into the trachea. But we're also shifting their heads a lot. We're rotating them, we're flipping them from sternal to lateral, and what we think is probably happening in some of these cases is that endotracheal tube is not moving as well as you'd like it to and it's actually bouncing back and forth and sometimes even the pressure necrosis from that cuff being in there can cause this as well. I have seen several tracheal tears post-dental. Some of them come in right after the dental, some come two or three days later. Those guys that are coming in two or three days later are probably more likely pressure necrosis. So now let's go down to actual lower airway disease, which is where we're gonna see most of our issues in our cats that are coming in in respiratory distress. So like I said, you have your trachea, you have your, your main stem bronchi, you branch off into little bronchiolars, eventually end up in the alveoli. And so I just sort of have the diagram from the textbook next to a feline patient. And so now we're gonna talk about some of the other things, right? Told you that obviously our lungs, our trachea are a big part of our respiratory system, but we can't forget about that space around it. You have your ribs, of course, you have your pleural space, which is the lining inside your thorax and is gonna be around all the tissue. And you have your mediastinum, which is sort of that weird tissue that when you're looking inside of a chest that sort of engulfs where your trachea is gonna be, your esophagus, esophagus is gonna be, thymus if you still have one, some of your lymph nodes, and it sort of envelops that tissue. So you can have disease in your mediastinum as well. If you look at this particular radiograph, you're gonna see that those lungs are pushed all the way up and we have a really hard time seeing anything ventrally. I'm assuming this cat has a heart, but I can't see it, right? So that right there tells me that there is something in the pleural space that is causing that issue. Definition time. So I am a little bit of a stickler for using the right phrases. Tachypnea is we're just breathing fast. You could be breathing fast because you're hot, because you just did exercise, or if you're like my cat, I laser pointered way too long with him and now he's panting. Orthopnea, think of the word orthopedic, like an orthopedic surgeon. That's when your patient is changing their body position to help them breathe better. That is your person that just ran a race, elbows out, neck out, or your bulldog, elbows out, neck out. Or the other thing you'll see sometimes is you'll have a patient come in in respiratory distress and you try and put them sternally and they go back lateral. Or you have them in the cage and they keep flopping from side to side to side. They're trying to help open up their airways. They're changing their body position to help them breathe. Dyspnea, that is completely different. That is not necessarily fast breathing or slow breathing. It's actually, by definition, a subjective feeling. Dyspnea refers to painful breathing. And there's three categories that the American Thoracic Society has logged into there. Air hunger, increased work or effort in breathing, and chest tightness. Hopefully no one in the audience has ever felt multiple of these, but air hunger, easiest way to think about this, if you've ever been in a swimming pool or diving and you all of a sudden realize I'm running out of air, and you start to get that panicky feeling that you need to shoot back up in the water, that's air hunger. That's your brain saying you need oxygen. I have also had chest tightness associated with that and it's almost like a spasming that is telling me I need to go get oxygen, but also increased work of breathing is part of it. And so when you have a patient who is tachypnic, fine. When you have a patient that's dyspnic, you need to address the physical discomfort associated with the breathing. So, presentation, I have a lot of very funny slides in here. There's always got to be some comic relief in any of my talks. The presentation of your feline respiratory emergency is going to be very, very dependent on where your problem is. All right, and so we always have that stereotypical open mouth panting cat, obviously respiratory, but sometimes it's more subtle. So, I don't remember which one of my professors said this to me. I wish I could actually quote them appropriately, but they taught us that 
history is going to be 80% of your diagnosis. A one-year-old cat coming in, open mouth breathing, panting, versus the 17-year-old cat, you're going to automatically start thinking of different things. Breed, we know that certain breeds are more likely to have different diseases. If you have a brachycephalic breed like a Persian, you absolutely will see more upper airway issues. If you have, sex probably doesn't come into play at all, but signalment, obviously we talk about age, breed, and sex. Do not forget to ask about the patient's past medical history. It's gonna help you. If that one-year-old cat already has a history of asthma, I'm already thinking what I can do to help with the asthma, even if it is not respiratory at all. We definitely see metabolic breathing where you have your cat come in who's got severe azotemia or a diabetic ketoacidotic cat. They're breathing fast because they're trying to get rid of all that acid. So that's where your history is going to come into play, whether it's respiratory or not. What is extremely important, if you look at this picture, yes, it's funny, but that oxygen cage oftentimes will save your patient's life. And I'll kind of get into that a little bit better now. So first off, that patient comes in, it is freaked out. All I need to do is physically look at the way it's breathing. Cosa abdominal, picture your bulldog that can't breathe well. The rate may not be fast, but they're using their entire abdomen to breathe. They're sucking in that gut and they're breathing with their belly. Restrictive, that is what you're gonna see with a lot of cases with pleural space disease, like your hemothorax, your chylus effusion. You sort of have this rapid, short breathing, and that is often seen, like I said, with pleural space disease. If you see that paradoxical breathing where instead of the ribs expanding, they're going in and vice versa. You can see that with pleural space disease, but you can also see that with trauma to the ribs or rib fractures. And if you see that their inspiratory pull and their inspiratory effort is much more than their expiratory, that's likely gonna be upper airway. So if you wanna picture a completely easy, simple one, if your dog comes in with a ball stuck in the back of their throat, they're not trying to push out. They're pulling with all their might to try and get air into their body. And so that's a super easy one. I mean, cats are smarter than my dumb dog. They're not gonna get something stuck in that airway, usually. But if you see them pulling with a ton of force, as opposed to pushing out, that oftentimes can help you focus in above the chest. So, okay, fine. Cat presented. I already have a little bit of a history. I found out, is this the first time we've had a medical emergency regarding our respiratory tract? Am I a one-year-old cat that I'm thinking maybe asthma, trauma, toxin? Am I a 14-year-old Siamese that I'm thinking cardiomyopathy? Okay, great. Well, now what do we do? Well, this, this is a great one. Do not tell my nutrition specialist that I have this in here, but that cat was just served a salad and he doesn't like it and I'm the same way. All right. This is probably the most important slide in my presentation, as silly as it seems. Minimize stress. That patient is already freaked out because they cannot catch their breath. They are panicked, they know that, they feel awful, they feel weird. Less is more, always. If you can't breathe and now you have a bunch of doctors and nurses holding you down for a catheter, for a temperature, for a quick radiograph, they are already panicked. They are already having issues breathing and now you're holding them down. And if they are trying to move their body position, that orthopnea, you're not allowing them to. And that is extremely stressful to them. So that is a picture of where I went to school. Think Grenada, West Indies, when you have these respiratory emergencies come in. Put them in that O2 cage, let them chill out. If you don't have an O2 cage, you have flow by, do that, leave them the heck alone. It, treat it sort of like your bird respiratory emergency where if you poke too much when they come in, they're going to die. Unlikely with a cat, but let them relax. Tell the family members, look, I am worried about your cat's breathing. You're worried about your cat's breathing. Your cat is as well. We're gonna stage things. I may not be able to get an x-ray for two, three hours from now. 
I'm going to treat certain things and keep your cat nice and relaxed so that I do not literally kill your cat trying to get information. Less is more, take your time, let them relax. As far as that oxygen tank that I was talking about. So by the law of physics, you and I are breathing about 21% oxygen at sea level, 21 to 23. If you're doing flow by, it's about 24, 25. I'm not sure where that 45 reference is coming from. Usually you're just up a couple percentage points with flow by. Loose fitting mask, that would be your plastic mask without that rubber piece around it. Those you can get up 35 to 55. Oxygen hoods, I do not like them. I know it's something that's discussed. I think that is actually counterproductive. Oxygen hood is when you essentially use an e-collar and you cover the entire front except for a little bit at the top and you can pass an O2 tube down there and you leave enough room so that they can breathe out. I don't know about you, but if someone put like a mask in my face when I was having trouble breathing that's like covering my entire face and eyes, I would be way worse. Nasal cannula, depending how far in they are, you can get anywhere from 30% up to 70%. So if you're placing indwelling cannulae, if you go to the medial canthus versus the lateral canthus, you're gonna be further down in the nose or nasal pharynx. So you're gonna have higher concentrations the further back you go. And some folks will actually do nasotracheal intubation where you have to do it visually, but you're actually gonna take that cannula and put it all the way down into the trachea, just the entry point. And obviously with intubation, that just means capturing your airway. There are plenty of patients, usually dogs again, that we just need to capture their airway. They don't have any respiratory pathophys that is abnormal. And so they're breathing room air, you're just intubated. But obviously we all know you can give up to 100% oxygen that way. What I just said earlier, they are nervous as hell. And the last thing that a respiratory patient needs is to be held down and forced to do anything. So the vast majority of respiratory distress cats, including my heart patients, I will give them 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg atorb. You can give it IM. You do not need to hold them down to give IV. Midazolam is also a great drug that you can use intramuscular or IV. Don't use it alone. Oftentimes when you use a benzo alone, you'll get sort of that phase two of anesthesia where they're overexcited and that's counterproductive. But using it with Torb is a very good option. The reason I have Midaz big, diazepam small, diazepam is a wonderful sedative and a wonderful anti-seizure medication, but it's mixed with propylene glycol. You cannot give it intramuscular. Not only will it hurt, but you can actually cause necrosis of the muscle. So if you have to pick and choose Midaz IM. Propofol, obviously we need intravenous access, but Alfaxalone I've used a few times for those, never for a cat, but a bulldog, who is in wicked respiratory distress, and of course he's nasty, and there's no head to hold on to and no muzzle that will work for him. So you can pop him in the butt with Alfax, and in five, 10 minutes, your, your friend is like half asleep and you can put your catheters in. I have not ever needed to do that for a cat. Do not forget your absolute best medical tool is attached to you. We all get very reliant on our fancy toys, our ultrasounds, our x-rays, and even some places will have EKGs that you can use on your phone. Put your hands on your patient. It, is important to do. You need to listen to them. You need to feel them. You need to see physically, is there anything else going on with them? You could learn a lot from putting your hands on a patient and not only save a ton of money for the client, but also a ton of stress on the patient. Emergency management. So again, because every cat is a jerk, this slide is perfect. What, what I have here is furosemide, one to two mg per kg. It is always difficult with your middle-aged patients that come in in respiratory distress that I'm not 100% sure if it is cardiac. It might be respiratory. It may even be like non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. 
It is not wrong to give a single dose of furosemide. I usually do a low dose, one mg per kg. You don't want to keep giving it over and over and over unless you know that they have cardiac disease. Because if you have asthma, for instance, every time you give that furosemide, you're drying out the airways. So all that mucus and all the secretions in the airway are now rock hard and dry. It is going to be much harder for them to get it out of their system. Also with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, same deal. If you're unclear, you're not sure, a slow dose of furosemide until you get a little more information is totally cool. So if you look at textbooks, the three things I'm about to talk about are technically reasons to ventilate a patient, put them on a mechanical ventilator. I disagree with the statement, and I like to say that's an indication to intubate. Persistent hypoxia, meaning that your arterial oxygenation or even your pulse ox is not improving with traditional management, meaning sedation, meaning flow by oxygen, being in the O2 cage. Persistent hypercapnia, same thing. If your patient's end tidal CO2 is 50, 60, 70, and it's not moving, and you're giving all these different things and it's not moving, or you're worried that that patient is literally about to respiratory fatigue, their entire function right now is focused on breathing, they are working really hard, they're really uncomfortable. To me, those are markers, okay, I need to sedate this patient, get them under control, let them relax, and place a breathing tube. That cat that I showed you way at the beginning with all that swelling, as soon as we put a breathing tube in, O2 sats went way up, respiratory pattern improved, his vitals improved, his color went from purple to nice and pink. All we did was put a tube down. He, his lungs were fine. He just could not breathe from all that discomfort and pain. So sometimes we do just have to knock them out and intubate them. This is a little humor. And um, I'm just going to leave that there and not talk about it because I can get myself in trouble. Radiographs. So we all have radiographs. Most hospitals nowadays have digital. We still have films. However you get them, that is fine. But do not forget, we can't just do a single lateral. It, you don't know what you're dealing with. This is a silly example. But if you look at the lateral of this cat, it looks like he has a microchip in the center of his chest. Like, did someone put that into his thorax? But when you flip him on his back, we obviously all see that it's sub-Q and it's right around the armpit. It's stupid. We all know that wasn't really in its chest, but that is just a really good example of why you need two, if not three, views. Now, if you're worried, you're literally going to kill your patient trying to get them. That's a different story. But... If you're doing it for diagnostic purposes, three views are the best, two laterals and a VD or a DV. But at the very least, please do two. This is actually a real radiograph that was sent to us here for interpretation on a respiratory distress cat. Please do not do that. There is like so many different things that are bad about this. The first thing being they're literally just holding this cat down by the chest that is not gonna help anyone's stress level. Two, that person is asking for cancer, God forbid. And three, I have no idea what's going on in this cat's chest. So sedation, use it, sandbags, use them. Please do not forget radiology safety. This particular picture is a patient that is presenting with respiratory distress and we're able to let them relax enough to get really good straight on views. And what you'll see is you have increased sternal contact, that heart looks more like it's taking about 50% of the chest. Maybe if you did vertebral heart score, it looks nice and big. That guy's a little more subtle than this guy. So yeah, I just told you to do two views, but on this lateral radiograph, I'm able to see this heart is enlarged, you could see this cotodorsal alveolar pattern, and that right there, that's heart failure. If you see that, your number one thought should be heart failure. Patchy interstitial to alveolar dorsal caudal, think heart failure. 
if you are able to see pulmonary vasculature well, sometimes it depends on your technique. Sometimes I had a hard time finding it until I was a couple years in. If you see an enlarged heart and that, then think heart failure. There was a study in felines that up to 50% of cats presenting in over heart failure did not have a murmur. So dogs and people, really helpful. Cats, not always. So even though this cat's in over heart failure, you may not actually hear a murmur. So that just adds to the stress as our clinical things just get more confusing. But again, caudodorsal patchiness, think heart failure. What about this guy? So we get a radiograph of this cat and at first it looks like maybe it's pleural effusion, but no, it kind of looks like everything's kind of pushed around and my heart's not centralized and I kind of can't see the heart and yeah, it kind of looks like pleural effusion, but I can see the back of the heart. If you were to palpate the very front of this cat's chest, you would have zero pliability. Normally when you squeeze a cat's chest, it's nice and smushy. This cat had a giant cranial mediastinal mass. So I got these pictures, but I also am feeling that there is something abnormal in the cranial mediastinum. So again, your hands. What about this guy? Well, this one's really bad. Unfortunately, we have horrific metastatic disease in this cat. All I have done, I've sedated. I've let them relax and I have these pictures. I now can tell a lot to my family members. If we're out in the Midwest, maybe I would be thinking fungal, but this is neoplastic until proven otherwise. And again, we have done very few diagnostics. We have spent very little money and we just garnered a ton of information on our respiratory cat. Sometimes you will take radiographs like these that you will then have a room of 25 specialists staring at an x-ray and saying, I have no idea what the hell I'm looking at. That happened with this one. This cat came in, always had a little bit of an increased respiratory rate. It presented to us because it was doing really poorly. And at first on that left picture, I thought, does this cat have like a gastroesophageal intussusception? And then I looked at the VD and I said, no, it doesn't. And then I looked at the other lateral and then it looks really weird. Unfortunately, we were not able to CT this cat nor do a post, but this baby went to heaven. Um, but you will sometimes get radiographs and look at them and go, no clue. So not always the best thing in the world, but again, I still don't know what the hell was wrong with this cat. A lot of us now have point of care ultrasound or POCUS. I don't spend too, too much time on presentation with point of care ultrasound. What I am looking for is a very rapid assessment. In theory, it should be done in under two to three minutes. If I am worried about free fluid in the belly, I'm going to literally take my probe, put it in four spots really quickly and see. And if you look at this picture from Greg Lissandro, he does mention using them in order of one, two, three, four. I don't necessarily do it that way, but I would recommend that you always do it the same way each time so you don't forget. As someone with ADD, I have to do it the same way each time or I will forget. So you don't necessarily have to go in that order, but go in the same order each time. Also, I want to point out, you don't always need to have your patient on their back. When you're doing it for a quick look and you're trying to see if there's free fluid in the chest or belly, it does not need to be perfect. You need to be able to see quickly what you're dealing with. Does my patient have pleural effusion? Does my patient have pericardial effusion? Does my patient have a ton of fluid in the belly? When you're looking at the thorax, if you were to picture where the heart would be, third to fifth intercostal space right behind that elbow, you want to look both sides there, and that's going to tell you a lot about your heart and your pericardium. If you want to look for where we might see a pneumothorax, we call it the chest tube site, so that's the area of the widest portion of the chest. And if this dog, I guess that is, in the picture were to come in, I could do this point of care focused ultrasound in two or three minutes and garner a lot of information. In human medicine, these are oftentimes called bedside ultrasounds. Radiographs, still, they're awesome. We use them, that is our standard. When you are worried about effusion though, radiographs aren't as sensitive. So 
In one study, they found that you need almost 9 mLs per kilogram of body weight to actually see that there's pleural effusion. Take your 10 kilogram patient, and we're now talking about it needs 90 mLs of fluid for you to actually pick it up on a radiograph. It's a pretty high amount. When you use that point of care ultrasound, you just cut that more than half. So that same 10 kg cat, if there's even 40 mLs, you're going to be able to spot it. The more you get used to using your probe, you will be able to spot very small amounts as well. Why does it matter about getting the effusion? Well, even just doing a quick thoracocentesis, we can garner a lot of information. I don't necessarily need to send out a cytology before I can tell something about this patient. In this particular pleural effusion, if you could see, it's kind of opaque. There's actually gross, chunky, floaty things in there, and it is not clear. The likelihood of that being a transidate is very low. The likelihood of that being pus or something kind of scary is very high. So just looking at it, it's going to help us know a lot. Cytology, absolutely send it off to be read. Culture and sensitivity, send it off to be read. Super important, but just looking literally what you have in your syringe is very helpful. I have pneumothorax in there as well. So again, thoracocentesis, it's not always just to get fluid. If you have complete loss of airway sounds bilaterally, your patient is breathing with that really restricted pattern and they just fell off the roof, it is never wrong to do a blind thoracocentesis, but that's another reason we poke needles in chests. The types of effusions, like I said, you can garner a lot of information just putting it in your PCV tube and spinning it down. What you're gonna be able to do is, number one, look at the cells. Even before you put it in that tube, you can physically look at the fluid, like I said, you can put it in your refractometer. If it has a protein of six and it's sort of that straw color, you might be dealing with FIP, whereas if it's got a total protein of two and it's straw color, you wanna be thinking things like heart disease and less Clear is gonna be that modified transidate. Those are the guys that have some cells in it, the protein sort of midline, that could be cardiac, that could be neoplastic, that could be inflammatory. That one's not as easy to understand. But again, if you just look at the fluid itself, it's great. If you see reddish pinkish fluid that's kind of scaring you for blood, if you spin it down and it's within 10 to 25% of the peripheral, it's probably blood, but the vast majority of times when you spin that down, even though it looks really bloody, it's probably gonna be one to 3%, so it's just serous sanguinous. Um, easy way to think about that, you know we've all seen those cats with urinary tract infection, it looks like they're urinating pure blood, you spin it down and there's like a tiny little pellet of blood at the bottom and it's yellow for the rest, same thing, same theory. Look at for yourself as well, you don't need to be a pathologist sometimes to catch something. The one on the left, pleural effusion, kind of has red cells, has some white cells, some platelets. I, I don't know what that is. The one in the middle, though, has a ton of bacteria in it. And you even see intracellular bacteria. So I know that it's not just that I hit the bowel or something. That is the body fighting an infection. The guy in the far right, unfortunately, I'm looking at that fluid and I'm seeing a ton of lymphocytes. And I'm seeing a ton of lymphocytes that look different from each other. I'm really worried about lymphoma and that guy in the far right. The one in the middle, I'm worried about a pyothorax. The one on the left, I don't know. I'm going to send that to a pathologist to look at. But you have your three-year-old cat and you see pus. That is a way better prognosis and a more reasonable thing to push your client, let's keep going, as opposed to that cat that's got a chest full of lymphocytes and they're kind of not on board to do chemo and, and multiple thoracocentesis. You may not need to send that cat who's in respiratory distress with a family that loves you because they've been coming to you forever and that's why they keep coming to you because you're an awesome doctor and an awesome person, they would rather you do that euthanasia, right? I mean, they trust you, they know you, they love you. So if you get a pleural effusion that looks like all lymphocytes and you have that conversation with the family, it's less stressful for the cat, it's less stressful for the family. Pro B and P, so that's my cat Waldorf, and see, I was trying to eat a salad and he wouldn't let me. Um, 
That is a very helpful test. IDEX actually has a snap test. With ProBNP, what it's actually telling you is stretch within the atrial ventricles. NT, ProBNP, and ProBNP are slightly different. But if you have a cat that comes in in acute respiratory distress, you have a cat who's got crackles, you have a cat who has pleural effusion, if you do that in-house test in eight minutes and it comes back abnormal, think cardiac. If it comes back normal, it's probably not the heart. It's 90% not the heart. So stop giving that patient furosemide as opposed to the one that comes up abnormal that's suggestive of cardiac failure. Not good for screening. This is for your acute respiratory distress patient. Again, we'll talk about those diuretics I mentioned earlier. I always start a mig per kig in my cats. Dogs, I tend to do two mig per kig. We just know that cats' kidneys are a lot more sensitive to diuretics, and that is just most importantly related to where the nephrons dip into the cortex, into the medulla. Cats tend to be more in the cortex, so they hit them a little harder. So I oftentimes will not do more than one to maximum two mig per kig. I know some folks will recommend four mig per kg. I think that is a whopping dose. For whatever reason, I've had a lot of success with furosemide constant rate infusions. You tend to respond better, and for whatever reason, I don't have a good answer for you. I tend to see less azotemia from it. But remember, if you are making a CRI, you have to make sure the dilution is very low meaning if I'm giving 0.5 milligram per kilogram per hour, I don't want to be giving 10 mils an hour to a patient in heart failure. So you need to do the dilution so it's as low as possible so you're not actually adding fluid to the system. Bronchodilators, I do use these a lot in my respiratory patients that are not cardiac. In theory, it's only going to work on the really small diameter Airways, so the ones that are right before the alveolus that are less than 300 micrometers. What they do is by affecting cyclic AMP or GMP, depending what you're using, it's going to take that constriction and relax it so that it's allowing more air to come in and out. It is very helpful for asthmatics because it's going to help relieve some of that expiratory pressure. It is really helpful for patients with pneumonia that are having trouble getting air in. I do like to use it. I tend to use aminophilin and theophylline. It's not better than terbutaline. It just is the one I trained on, so I like it. Albuterol, don't forget your inhalers are great for rescue drugs. If I have a patient that is in terrible respiratory distress, it's a one-year-old cat, I really think it's probably asthma or maybe, maybe it's pneumonia. If you can give them a puff of albuterol, that is super helpful to them. And again, I don't want you holding them down for an hour trying to get it into them, but if they're tolerating it, a puff or two of albuterol is awesome. Antibiotics, just quickly, if you think you have a septic patient or you think you have a patient who has bacterial pneumonia, start antibiotics. I, I am all about antibacterial stewardship. I do not use antibiotics very often in my patients, but if you have a patient that you think is septic, for every hour delay you have in using appropriate antibiotics, you have a seven and a half to eight and a half increased risk of death. You think you have a septic abdomen cat, obviously it's not respiratory, do not wait to give it antibiotics, give it. We can always stop them, but we can't start them later and have the same sort of survival rate. There are some respiratory emergencies that aren't technically respiratory emergencies. We actually have a cat here now that had a thyroid storm, came in with a heart rate of 300, panting, open mouth breathing, super fast breathing. When you looked at it, his chest rads kind of looked normal. He had no free fluid in his belly. His BNP was normal. He has a history of thyroid disease. I asked the owners, we get him on a beta blocker. Heart rate drops, respiratory rate drops, cat's fine chilling out in ICU. Other non-real emergency cases, again, we talked about the DKA and the uremic patient. They have very acidic blood. The only way to get rid of acid or base is either your kidneys or your lungs. Remember, respiratory, alkalosis, acidosis, metabolic. So when you have a really bad azotemic patient, sometimes they're breathing fast, sometimes even with their mouth open, their lungs are totally fine. So 
remember those guys as well. We could see neurogenic breathing. We've seen chain stokes, or you see that patient that just had a seizure whose pattern is very strange, or they're doing a really rapid and really slow breathing. We might see that from neurogenic trauma or brain disease. We all know what happens when our dogs and cats get really hot. They pant, right? It's not actually a respiratory emergency. That patient is just trying to get rid of that exhaust. Trauma, they're painful. Do not forget pain control. Pain control is super duper important and you are never gonna stabilize a painful patient. So now what? All right, I found out what's wrong with it. I let it relax. I gave it some medications. What the hell am I supposed to do with this cat now? That, is, that picture there is actually what us in the ER do to the other specialists, but you can do it to us also. I don't need them perfect. I don't need them breathing like nothing happened. Try and get them to a point where you feel comfortable enough with them getting in the car, driving 20, 30 minutes to a specialty hospital. Call ahead, let them know, hey, just so you know, I think I have a heart failure coming in. Their ETA is like 20, 30 minutes, so that when that stat is called, we're already waiting for it. And prepare your clients for what they're about to expect. You have a ton of pleural effusion, you tap that pleural effusion, the cat's breathing great, let them know they're probably gonna get an echocardiogram, they may have more radiographs, they may need cytology, but just sort of get them thinking about what to expect at the next place, just so they're not caught off guard. Big, 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 big piece of this conversation, like I said, limit stress. The most important thing I can tell you for any respiratory distress patient, let them relax. Also, be very aggressive early to decrease your morbidity and mortality later. I would mentioned earlier, you have a trauma that has a pneumothorax. Tap the pneumothorax. If it is not a continuous pneumothorax, they are going to be unbelievably more stable. You have a cat that has pleural effusion. It's got a boatload of it. You just removed 200 mLs of that fluid. That cat driving up here is going to be breathing like everything's normal. And so it allows you to slow down and allows them to relax a little bit. It's never wrong to give oxygen. You're not gonna get oxygen toxicity in an hour, two hours, even in 24 hours. If you see a dyspneic patient or a methopneic patient, do not forget there is pain associated with it. Butorphanol is a great drug for that. In people, you never wanna use a narcotic with respiratory distress because it suppresses your respiratory center in your brain. Sometimes you'll have owners say, whoa, 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 why are you giving a narcotic? Luckily, our patients do not have that suppression. That's why our patients don't die from a little too much fentanyl or they don't die from a little too much methadone. Give them pain control, give them something to relax. Again, don't be afraid to intubate. Very rarely will you need to in the feline respiratory emergency, but if you just cannot catch up, do it. All right, one little side note, they did mention earlier that I am in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion for DACVEC. We have a really big problem in our world right now where people still think mental health should be stigmatized. If I were a diabetic, I wouldn't hide that I'm on insulin. We need to talk to each other. We need to be there for each other. We have an extremely high burnout and suicide rate in our field. We need to stop acting like mental health is a bad thing. I'm on multiple medications. It allows me to be a better doctor and a better person. Take care of each other. Don't be afraid to share your always your lifelines and do not forget that person next to you may be in a real bad spot. So always be there to listen. Anyhow, thank you. And hopefully you guys had a good time and I'll open it up for questions now. Let me see if we can. Well, the comment says freaking love you. I'm proud of you, Burko. <laughs> Thank you. So you can put questions in the chat or you can kind of, you know, just shout them out as you have them. Rick, I may need you to read them to me also. Yes, I can, I can do that now. Uh, actually, while I'm here, I don't want to forget my email address is there. It doesn't need to be for the mental health part. If you need to phone a friend, you can always call or email me. I do not mind even if it never is going to come into the hospital call us, like we're here, we're here to help you. I care more about the patient than I do about my paycheck. So even if you know they're never gonna get here, phone a friend, seriously, don't, don't hesitate.
Um, and also I'll wait for questions to come in. Just uh, some people had, had um, t uh, put it in the chat. They asked, oh, I wish this was recorded. These lectures are recorded. Um, our past lectures, we've added them to our YouTube channel. Yes, North Star has a YouTube channel where you can find past lectures. You won't be able to get CE credit there. However, um, hopefully very soon, we've been working really hard in this past couple of months. We're gonna have an app called um, NSVU and it's in the home stretch, hopefully should be released soon. And you'll be able to watch previous CE lectures there and get credit for it. We're, we're working really hard on it. It's just, you know, it, these things take time. Uh, but once it is ready to go, we'll let everybody know. Um, so things that questions. Yes, oncology lecture will be recorded as well. Yep. Um, so since my hospital sends respiratory patients that need, oops, keeps moving. Um, <laughs> my hospital sends respiratory patients that need it on portable oxygen. Do you think this makes a positive difference? My hospital is about 45 minutes from any referral. Yeah, that's always tricky. So yes and no. I have had patients delivered intubated with technicians driving them. That is awfully nice and awfully sweet, but do not forget as soon as you leave your hospital doors, you are no longer covered for malpractice or anything that happens bad. So just be careful with that. There are ambulance services that exist. They're awesome when they're available. If you are comfortable sending a patient with a portable oxygen tank, knowing that it has some dangers, sure. You can do it, flow by, loose fitting mask, tell them to eventually get it back to me. It's a great idea, just be a little bit weary of the ramifications. Unfortunately, we live in a very litigious world and I don't want it to blow up in your face. But yeah, if you have the ability and you trust, go ahead and do it. Karina wants to know, what about that high flow life? Yeah. So we now have high flow nasal O2 at North Star Vets. That is a conduit between nasal oxygen and putting a patient on a ventilator. It is essentially flow by on steroids. It's, a, it's CPAP, it's constant positive airway pressure. You have your patient who's wide awake with nasal prongs in. There's a very high rate of oxygen going in. It's humidified, it can be up to 100% at very high levels, literally 20, 30, 40 liters per minute. The way it's designed, it's sending that air down and it is not at all turbulent, so your patients don't mind it. I know it sounds crazy to think you have a cat on eight liters per minute and they're not reacting, but they don't. What's great about it is when I ventilate a patient, I always have PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. What that's doing is it's keeping my airways open so they're not slamming shut. That helps with oxygenation and ventilation. What's great about high flow is you actually have positive pressure on inspiration and expiration. So that's what CPAP is, constant positive airway pressure. What that means for your patient is they are constantly having pressure within the airway system, which is gonna help you oxygenate and ventilate better and allow for better gas exchange and far less trauma to the airways from opening and closing rapidly. Um, we have it here now, I love it. I truly think that at least two of my patients were kept off the vent. I know for a fact that one of our Great Dane patients would not be alive if we did not use high flow. It, the dog came in, it had a horrific pneumonia. It was orthopnic, it was a blue Great Dane whose gums were as blue as he was. This dog left the hospital in a couple of days, perfect. And I can tell you without any hesitation, high flow saved that dog's life. So Natalia has asked, where do you recommend to become AFAST, TFAST certified? Is it a, a seminar? Is it a textbook? Do you just kind of practice and learn as you go? So that one's a little bit of a, a sticky answer. There are programs that you can do it. For instance, if you go to IVEX, I know that they have conferences. The actual certification phase of it, I don't really know that there's many bodies that will give you a, yeah, you're certified in it. I think the more you do and the more you watch, the more comfortable you'll be. At this point, there's not really a certification for it. As far as ultrasound equipment, we have a couple different types here at North Star, but I literally have an iPad kind of laptop thing that I have a probe attached to that I can literally walk around and do an ultrasound wherever I want. It is perfect for AFAST, TFAST. I don't need 
perfection. I don't need to see everything in the world, but I can check for pericardial effusion. I can do a quick LAAO ratio. I can look to see if there's peritoneal effusion. So the, the short answer is, I don't know. Use it, get used to it. You're gonna get good at it. It's very easy once you're comfy with it. On the next question, it says, you mentioned propofol and Alfax. Could you use Tealazole? You can, but you need to be careful because Tealazole is really potent. And sometimes we, when we have a respiratory distress patient, it burns going in and then it hits them really hard. And sometimes it's a little too hard and you can cause respiratory depression or arrest. I would use very low doses if I were going to do that. Um, if you don't have any other options, absolutely, it's better than nothing. But I would aim more for a narcotic like butorphanol, plus or minus value midazolam. If you have it, use it. I'm not a huge fan of using dexmedetomidine in respiratory cases. It is a great option. I am just afraid of it. I know our anesthesiologists use it regularly. I personally don't, which is why I didn't have it on the slide, but that is another option for you. That kind of goes into my next question, which, which is, what is your go-to sedative for these guys and Torb. what's the dose? Torb. A dog or cat, I start with 0.2 mg per kg Torb IM, put them in the O2 cage and walk away from them, let them chill out. You can do it a couple times. It may take five minutes. It may take 20 minutes. You may need to do it more than once. I do 0.2 mg per kg of Torb, let them cook, and then I circle back. And I often can do a thoracocentesis on just that alone. Sometimes you do need to mix in a little midaz, but again, do not use midaz alone. Do not use Valium alone. You're going to excite the hell out of your patient, and it's going to do the opposite. Um, what's your feeling on low-dose ACE? Same thing. I'd hesitate on low-dose ACE in a cat only because you can't reverse that. You don't have antecedent or anything to reverse that alpha-2 effect. Um, it's not as predictable as dexmedetomidine either. So dogs, I use it, and I will use like a 0.01 to 0.02 mg per kg dose in dogs. I'm very weary about it in cats with respiratory emergencies. Would you ever do ACE and TORB together? In a cat, no. Um, I'd be very worried that they're going to be too out. And if we have them too out and they completely lose their respiratory drive, then we obviously did the wrong thing. You can, I'm sure a million and 12 people do it with great success. I just, it scares me to use two different drugs that I cannot reverse either of them fully. I mean, then there's a comment that says respiratory pattern, pleural effusion versus pulmonary edema. Pleural effusion is gonna be more that sort of restricted pattern where you're taking short, quick, choppy breaths, whereas a lot of times when you see actual pulmonary disease, you're going to see a patient who's breathing really heavy, really big inhales and exhales. Um, it's not an always, but if you see that short, choppy breathing, think pleural space or rib fractures or hole in, in chest, whereas if you see just sort of labored breathing, big inhales, exhales, it's probably not pleural space disease. Last chance for questions, guys. And again, seriously, don't be shy emailing me. And again, take care of each other, please. All right. So thank you very much, Dr. Berkowitz. Don't forget, everyone, we have our two lectures in June, one on, on June 6th in person about oncology and one on June 21st. It will be in person here at Northstar. Um, it's about um, getting the most out of your anesthesia and how to do it safely, things like that. Um, invite for that's going out tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. And we appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next event. Mm -hmm.